I also think when you look at models this way, language models start to feel less like agents that have their own kind of agency and more just like, oh, this is like a calculator. The more context the model has about uh, why you're doing what you're doing or what your goals are, the better its suggestions are generally going to be. Do you have custom instructions set for this? I don't actually. Oh my um, God. Okay, so I have a bunch of books in front of me and I wanna see if it can recommend books. The Brothers Karamazov, Medieval Technology and Social Change. Exhalation, Ted Chang. The Essential Kabbalah. Synthesize the vibes below into a single paragraph. Holy <laughs> Synthesize more. <laughs> wait 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 so you said synthesize more and then all caps compress i love compress. it compress a ai researcher you <laughs> ai Dennis, welcome to the show thanks thanks for having me excited to be here yeah, I'm excited to have you. We're, we're, we've been friends for a while. I interviewed you like, I, I think about a year, year and a half ago. And it was like when I was first starting to write about AI and that interview wow. went super viral. Um, and uh, hoping we can replicate some of that, some of that <laughs> magic here today. But um, I just, I don't know. I love getting to talk to you. You're, you're a researcher, you're a tinker. Um, you're just a, you're a really, really deep thinker and a great writer. Um, for, for folks that are listening that don't know, um, uh, in addition to like uh, doing a bunch of side research and side projects and tinkering in, in LLMs, you also uh, work for Notion uh, on their AI team, prototyping new interfaces for AI. Um, so, so we'll get into that. We'll get into some of your your thinking about LLMs and, and how LLMs fit into creative work and, and creative thinking. We'll get into some prototypes you're building, um, or maybe demos you have. We'll talk about Notion stuff. And then, of course, we will talk about how you use ChatGPT. Yeah, I think that interview that you talked about I think it came out almost exactly a year ago, if not exactly a year ago. And I think it was, uh, I think, safe to say pivotal for both of us, at least certainly for me. Um, that interview is a big part of how I ended up at Notion, um, which is which I've spent the last year at. And it's been very fascinating. To, uh, a great place to be for the last year as lots of things have happened in AI. So um, yeah, kind of timely. I love it. I love that it's a, a, a year a year ago. I think it would be great to maybe make this an annual thing. And I don't know, like, what the next step is after getting helping you get a job at Notion. Like, what's the like, what's the next level thing? Like, meeting Taylor Swift or something. But like, maybe we could that maybe be, we could make it work. That'd be something. Yeah. <laughs> so here's where I want to start. So basically, I've said before on this show, and I've written a lot about it, that I think ChatGPT is uh, one of the most or the most uh, important creative tools of the decade. And I, and I really think that people sort of misunderstand how important ChatGPT in specific and, and a lot of the AI tools that are being built right now in general are going to be for creative, creative thinking and creative work. Um, and I really think that you're one of the people on the forefront of thinking about that. There are, a, there are a lot of people out there who are like just really afraid of AI right now and really feel like, oh, it'll like replace everything that we do. And it creates this like inhuman future. Um, and I find you to be one of the deep thinkers and builders in the space that is trying to think about how to make AI into a human future where it, it sort of augments us and helps us live fuller lives. And I think that's really, really incredible. Um, when I was researching this episode, I came across this quote that you wrote um, recently where you said, um, I want to build interfaces that lets the AI gesture us into a better future without infringing on our agency. Um, I love that. I think it like really captures the spirit of your philosophy. And I just wanted to start there. Like, tell us about that quote. Tell us why you wrote it um, and, and how that fits into the larger way you think about AI. Yeah, I think, um, I think agency is really interesting. I think a lot of the way that I think about language models in particular, I think what we're starting to see that models for of different modalities all kind of have um when you take a ten thousand foot view similar kind of immersion capabilities but language is sort of the thing that seems most human like to us and so we talk about it a lot um and i think the way that i look at language models personally has been colored by the fact that um while i work uh like a lot of other people other people i work with language models at that like sampled output level of just like telling it things and then it, it tells me things back i also work with it at like a numbers level and mm -hmm. so, um, and, and, and like looking at embeddings and so on. And I think, and some of that we'll, we'll get to in a bit, but I think because of that, um, I 
personally, when I look at a language model, it is really just like a function that predicts a probability distribution. Um, while you can wrap it in very anthropomorphic packaging that makes it seem like it has kind of its, uh, its own will and its own kind of intent. And it might you could project kind of people like properties to it and say it wants things. Ultimately, it's like a, it's a statistical model of a probability distribution, just like a very complex one. And so I think that colors out a lot of my own thinking about how I view the technology. Um, but just because it's like a pure function that models a probability distribution doesn't mean that we may accident, doesn't prevent us from accidentally building things with a technology that take away agency from the things we want to do. Um, mm. I think an interesting example is uh, a coworker and a friend of mine at Notion and I were, um, we were talking about making, this is kind of a silly example, we were talking about making a cover image for an, a party that she was organizing. And she had this very particular aesthetic in mind of a cover image, which was kind of like a very, this is basically a very ugly painting on parchment, uh, not something you would consider aesthetic. Um, and she's like, I want this very specific aesthetic. Here's some like images I got off of Twitter that follow this aesthetic. Can you make one in this aesthetic of like, like a girl sipping wine or something? I don't remember the exact example. Um, and I tried so hard to uh, use all of the image generation tools at my disposal, uh, like Stable Diffusion, Excel, Dolly 2, Dolly 3, all these tools, even some of my own kind of image to image tools to make an ugly image. And it's just very difficult to get Dolly to make an mm -hmm. ugly image. Um, it's, I, I think that's interesting to me because, um, and this is something I've talked to with, something I've, I've talked to some folks at Midjourney about also, about how the tool kind of constrains the search space of possible images you can generate um, so that normally it's kind of closer to what you want because normally you want something aesthetic, but in the process, it may actually sort of take away in the design of the tool, if not necessarily yeah. the capability of the model, it takes away um, some agency from the user. And so I think the, under, the underlying technology, I think is um, kind of just like a, a, a tool, a function, whatever, a mathematical object. Yeah. Um, but then we, we don't want to wrap it accidentally in, in packaging that is empowered with us. That's really interesting. I want to like, I want to back up because you said a lot of different things there. And I think, I think they're really interesting and really important to unpack. So what I heard, what I heard you say is sort of um, AI or, or at least the current generation of AI models is a function that models a statistical probability distribution. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when we experience that ourselves, um, we have all these like reactions to it that we like anthropomorphize it. Um, we project out what it might be able to do from what it can do today in ways that are maybe unrealistic or maybe don't like fully understand like what it's what it is current how it currently works, um, and um, and depending on the probability distribution that you um, that you select, so like uh, the for example the 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 probability distribution that you create from the training set of images that you use to mm -hmm. to, to train your model or the training set of you know text that you use for example. Um, depending on those, depending on those things, um, you're going to, uh, create a certain set of possibility space of outputs, um, that, that sort of constrains the user. Um, and in, I think in, in your view, basically like how that is selected and communicated is like, is, is maybe important because, um, but like you said, like Dolly, you can't get it to go build to make an ugly image. It's not built for that. So it kind of like takes away agency from you because it's doing some stuff for you in a way that like, I don't know, maybe like Photoshop, for example, um, you can just manipulate the pixels. So, so right. there's no, uh, there's no agency taken away in that experience. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah. I think there, there are a lot of different pretty subtle ways that, um, either intentionally or intentionally shapes the kind of agency landscape of a tool. Yeah. Um, one very explicit example is, is like a tool like um, Dolly 3, where the model is through training made so that it, it has a, it, it, it's um, sort of fundamentally unlikely to output bad looking images. Um, I think there are other examples. So like Photoshop is actually an interesting example because um, even if in theory you could kind of make everything by just like moving the raw pixels around. Yeah. I think the, the specific, um, the specific features that are easy to access tends to also shape the kind of style of output. Um, and so like, if you look at uh, popular image editing tools, like you can tell when an image is made in Instagram stories, or you can yeah. tell when an image 
has its background masked out by like um, Keynote or something. Yeah. And so all of these tools, even in previous level ways, kind of tend to shape the, the output style. Um, and and, uh, and yeah. I mean, I feel like that's part of what makes what makes art in general. Like, you know, if you think about the music styles that are popular, it's like based on what the sound boards uh, can do and, and, and all the weird effects, or like the, you know, the electric guitar and the weird effects that like Jimi Hendrix discovered, like those are, in some ways they're like limiting our agent, limiting the artist agency, but they also create this unique set of constraints that creates a unique vibe and sound that, that represents a genre or a generation. Yeah, you, you touched on something really interesting there. Um, imagining the output space as a very concretely spatial kind of thing. Mm. Um, what, this is, for me, very concrete because I think a lot about embeddings and embeddings exist in a very concretely kind of spatial space. An embedding is a list of numbers that try to summarize uh, quantitatively what some piece of text or what some piece of image semantically contains. And so an example use case of an embedding, so you have an embedding model, which is kind of like a language model with its like last part of it chopped off so that we, we can read out the raw numbers. Um, and you can have an embedding model, and you might feed an embedding model sentences like, the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, and the president of France is blah, and, um, and like Notion is a tools for thought company. And two of those sentences are much closer in meaning than the third one. And so when you feed them into an embedding model, the embedding model will spit out for each of these sentences, a list of numbers. And when you view the list of numbers as kind of a coordinate or point in space in a high dimensional kind of coordinate space, um, those numbers are going to be closer together for sentences that are closer together. And so yeah, the, the way that I think about it sometimes is like you can take text and then assign pieces of text like a latitude and longitude coordinate, and that's an mm. embedding. And then you can map the text and then see which pieces of text are closer to, to each other. And the ones that are closer on the map, the ones that have a latitude and a longitude that are closer are going to be similar in meaning. And I think that that like, yeah, that, that sort of like clicked for me where I was like, oh, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Another metaphor that I sometimes use is like a, like a, a color picker. So if mm. you use any kind of image editing tool, one of the ways you can pick colors is like a 2D grid or like a color circle yeah. where you have two dimensions, you can move uh, things around and then you move the dot around and you're changing kind of the RGB values. Um, there are a couple different ways to describe a color. One way is by an RGB value, which is kind of like a coordinate or a latitude longitude for, color, for a color. Another way you could describe a color is by just saying like uh, orange or like very yeah. dark blue or crimson. Yeah. Um, and I would, in my head, the like dark blue or crimson word description is like the input. And then conceptually, the RGB value is kind of like the embedding. Um, yeah. I think that's really interesting because it kind of hints at this possibility that uh, uh, embeddings or these like numerical representations might encode kind of pretty fundamental semantic insights about the the thing that you're encoding, color or text, in a way that lets us kind of mathematically manipulate it to do interesting things. Like, mm -hmm. um, if you have the word crimson, you can't really like, you can't manipulate it in ways like making it lighter or making it more blue or whatever. But if you have the RGB value, there are very um, concrete algorithms that you can use, like number crunching to do, to make the color a lighter shade of crimson or like a more blue or more purple. Right. Um, no, I love that. I mean, that's, that's sort of very central to, I think, some of your thinking around this, which mm -hmm. is like, um, the current generation of AI tools are awesome. Chat is great. Um, but uh, you know, manipulating images or text via chat is, um, it's a very uh, coarse grained tool. Um, and it's, it's a lot harder to, to get the exact thing that you want. Um, and, you know, I think you've, you've thought about a lot like AI interfaces that allow you to um, uh, be more precise about how you move through uh, uh, different ways that you want to modify an image or a text using using AI. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think thinking in that way, the spatial way of thinking about possi the possibility space of outputs of these models, um, the, the spatial view, I think, is uh, kind of behind the way that I think about how to add more precision to these kinds of tools. Yeah. Um, one kind of, I don't know if, it, should I just pop into a demo? Yeah, let's do um, it. So the interface for this is very bad because it's so, just... So wait, so let me just back up. So this is a tool yeah. called Varna, and you built this yourself. Yes. Um, this is one of a string of experiments. I may share some other ones later. Um, but I 
this is actually half built. I tried, I was in the process of building something different and then it, like it started being useful uh, and I didn't really pull, like, feel like putting more effort into it. And so it's in a very half finished form, but it's good for demonstrating this particular thing that I'm about to walk you through. So okay, and what is the like general thing that you wanted to build it for? What was it? What was the original idea really quick? The original idea was to try to let you do, um, to try to let you describe an image that you want to create by adding and subtracting images and text. So um, there's a model called Clip uh, by OpenAI. This is actually a model that's been around for a while. If you use any kind of multimodal, like use text to semantically search images kind of search engine tool, um, Clip is likely to be one of the models behind that kind of thing. Um, the special thing about Clip is that it tries to describe both text inputs and image inputs in the same embedding space, in the same coordinate space. So that if you put in a word like Eiffel Tower and a, uh, and a French flag, the model is going to understand the meaning behind both of those things and try to cluster them together because they're similar. Um, so uh, a slightly newer thing that happened um, after Clip came out is that people uh, came up with an, a way of generating images conditioned on a specific point in this Clip embedding space so that you could put in an image or you can put in a text and then try to generate an image that is kind of conceptually the image that corresponds to that point in the space. So if you, if you put in a bunch of images of uh, butterflies, they all kind of cluster around the same point in this embedding space, in this coordinate space. And then if you pick one of those points in that cluster and then generate an image back out corresponding to that point, you would get some image of a butterfly. And so given this ability to both take an image or text and encode it into the space, and then pick a point in this space and decode it back out into its corresponding original image form. Maybe you can generate an image not by just typing a text prompt, but by uh, mixing a bunch of concepts together in this space. So if you want a butterfly uh, that has the colors of the French flag, maybe you can mix the image that is of the French flag and an image of a butterfly, just pick a point in between these two concepts in the embedding space and then decode it out. And maybe it'll mix those concepts together. So that's the kind of idea I was trying to explore with this little hack. Um, the thing that I'll show you now is here, I'll, I'll pick, um, this is a, a selfie of myself. Um, for dumb demo reasons, I have to put myself in twice. And then um, this is an illustration. This is my, actually this is a PNG. Let's do something different. This is a, this is a kind of clip art illustration of a human face. Mm. Um, and I'm going to, so what, what this tool is going to do is, is kind of embed both of these images. Mm -hmm. They correspond to slightly different points in the clip models embedding space. And then I'm going to use uh, this tool to pick kind of eight different points along the line between these two images mm. and then decode all, each of them out. Um, into its own image. And so we're basically sampling the distance between these two images yeah. in this in this embedding space and, and trying to look inside the model and see kind of what the model sees at each of these points. That's very cool. Yeah, like I, like like a way that I would think about this is like, you know, if you're if you're used to Photoshop or something or Instagram or any of these, any any photo editing capability, um, they have all these like sliders that you can do for like make it brighter and you can on the left it's like you know uh it's very very bright and on the right it's very very dark and you can just slide in between mm -hmm. and what you're building here is a slider between almost like concepts or ideas for images so like one on the on the left side is like your headshot and on the right side is like a sort of vectorized drawing cartoon drawing that is in a style that you like and you're just sort of seeing uh, if you slowly turn your um, your headshot into that, like what are the different points along that space? Right. You could also, uh, speaking of sliders, you could also uh, not just slide along this kind of stylistic scale, but you could start to do fun things like slide along a, an emotion scale. So mm -hmm. one thing that I've done before here is um, I'll try to go from uh, 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 an image of a young man who is happy to an image of a young man who is very, very angry. <laughs> and uh, there we go. Now you, you get progressively more and more mad. <laughs> um, you can see the effect is really intense. So at the end, yeah. it kind of destroys the image. So sometimes I, I tone down the text effect. Um, the, the, the way that I arrived at, so th this is one of many experiments that I've done to try yeah. to 
build interfaces around exploring embedding spaces and latent spaces of, uh, of generative models instead of talking to the model directly. Mm -hmm. The reason this is interesting to me is kind of twofold. One, I think it's just intellectually really interesting that yeah. in the process of learning how to predict the next token or in the, in the process of trying to model probability distributions of language, the model internally learns and learns to pull out uh, kind of human recognizable, semantically useful concepts like yeah. motions. Um, and I think learning how models do that and, and understanding it to improve models or make them more controllable, I think is useful. And just the, the fact that the models do that, I think is interesting. So I want to understand it better. Um, I also think when you look at models this way as a thing that gives you dials and as a thing that gives you numbers that you can manipulate, uh, language models start to feel less like agents that have their own kind of agency and more just like, oh, this is like a calculator. Right. Um, um, Simon Wilson, Wilson uh, who's one of the prominent bloggers in the space, actually has a really great blog post about language models as a thought kind of a thought calculator. Um, where uh, he talks about a similar idea. Um, one, way to look, one way to look at this demo is, is a kind of a calculator for images and concepts and text. Um, and unlike asking Dolly, the experience of asking Dolly 3 through ChatGPT to generate an image, which feels like you know, like asking this entity, this agent for requests. Um, here it's like, okay, it's, there's very concretely like a thing that does math um, and you can use it to, to get dials and, and control. And that feels more like a tool and it feels like perhaps there's a direction here that lets you retain more agency as a person. I feel like one of the, one of the things I'm getting from this is when people use these AI tools, this generation of AI tools for the first time, there's this like, whoa, factor. Like I, um, I was using it um, the other day. I had like done a lot of journaling. I've been going through some like stuff in my personal life. I've been doing a lot of journaling about it. And I fed like, I don't know, 4,000 words of journals into Claude. I did Claude and ChatGPT, but I find Claude to be like slightly better for this. Um, and it outputted a bunch of, you know, I ask it like, what am I not seeing? What are the patterns that you, you're observing in my psychology or the psychology of people around me? Like all that kind of stuff. And it'll output all this stuff. And I screenshotted that and I sent it to my therapist. And he was like, hmm. that's totally wild. And I was like, cool. Like he must think this is awesome. He's like, it's so good. And I was like, this is amazing. And then he was like, I thought we would have at least a couple hmm. years until it would be this good. And then he was like, do you think there's, do you think that there's room for like human therapists anymore? And I was like, oh no, like now I have to be like comforting my therapist because he's afraid of the AI. And like my feeling is like, he had that immediate like oh, shit, moment that everyone has. But if you really dig into these tools, they do amazing stuff, but like, they're not even close to, in my opinion, like, for example, replacing a therapist. Um, and I think part of the reason why people have that, oh, shit, which is what you're, I think what you're referring to here is um, we just respond to things that feel really intelligent. And if the same thing was performed in a slightly different way, like with a slider like this, um, it would still be cool, but it would feel more familiar, like a tool that we would, that we might use anyway, like a calculator that, that is in itself sort of mind blowing, but isn't threatening or um, uh, sort of, it, it's, it, it's not like a replacement in the same way that like a fully intelligent thing is. Is that like mm -hmm. a fair way to describe what you're, what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. When you train a model there, there are fundamental capabilities you bake into it and the packaging that you wrap it in. Um, really dramatically influences how people receive it and they use it. Yeah. You know, if you took some like human neurons and just like laid them out in the right way and, and wrapped them in like an interface, like it might look like a tool too. Um, Certainly. And, um, and if you just get enough of those, if you just get enough of those neurons together, uh, you get a brain that's like conscious and can do things and think like, how does, how do the, how do your, how do these two things like fit together? That's an interesting question. I haven't thought about that. I think off the cuff, my kind of intuitive reaction is, uh, I think it's an interesting, it would be an interesting intellectual and societal endeavor to try to build a thing that is like a simulacrum of humans in every way, um, including having some kind of, uh, goals and agency and so forth, so on and so forth. And I think if that was the goal of like building a simulacrum of everything that, that at least intellectually makes us human, um, you would want to build in uh, elements that these current tools don't have. Um, 
like trying different things in exploration. I think ex exploration, intentional exploration is actually like a huge part of intelligence that humans have that these models currently don't exhibit. Um, however, I think when companies like Google and uh, OpenAI and even Notion try to build a kind of language model based tools that help you do your work, um, there are a lot of there are a lot of parts of a human intelligence that actually are kind of annoying when you're just trying to like get some work done. Like uh, the fact that humans like sometimes just sit at their desk and daydream is like probably not that useful if you're trying to just like hire an entity to like you know read thousands of papers and try to summarize them. And so I my gut feeling is that a lot of these kind of corporations and teams that are building AI to be useful and especially in a professional context, their goal is not to build a simulacrum of humans. Their, con their goal is just like build a thing that is like an intelligence kind of engine, um, steam engine. And then uh, I could imagine some other research groups or some other groups of people whose goals would be to build a simulacrum of humans. But I think there's, um, in the beginning, I think they tend to look similar, but I think as we get further down this road, uh, we're going to see a kind of divergence between people who really want to like build a simulacrum of humans versus people who just like want an intelligent thought calculator. I went to um, I went to OpenAI Dev Day, and um, they they did this whole presentation on how they fine tuned GPT four using Slack messages. Right. And uh, did you see this? And basically, like they asked the, the this fine tuned version to do something, and it was like, no, I'll do it later. <laughs> and then it was yeah. like, do it or you're fired. And it was like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, like yeah. you're right. There's all these like parts of being human that like maybe we don't necessarily want to model for. For the AIs we build, and 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 there's some divergence there in terms of like, is it a tool or is it something that has agency and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think I've run into some, something actually very similar where I was um, when I so I have I have a personal chatbot that is sometimes used for like kind of brainstorming, kind of entertainment purposes. Can we see and, it? Uh, I can. Um, hmm. Here, I'll I'll open it up. Yeah, well, you have a personal chatbot. I have a personal chat bot. Um, <laughs> it's an iMessage bot because I like having it in iMessage because it's accessible kind of from all my devices. Apple does all the syncing for me and it looks nice and I can react to things. Um, I, I haven't used it in a while, but I could ask it something like... Um, well, you, it looks like you asked it, like what makes Notting Hill particularly picturesque compared to other neighborhood areas like Westminster? Tell me about that. <laughs> I, I was I was visiting London and I was trying to look for... Look for um, neighborhoods to visit. Actually, we can ask something about London. We could say, um, what do you think think about london versus new york Where and why would you ask this versus like asking ChatGPT? like um how is this built what is it trained on why is it its answer better would you rather live um as a 25 year old um so there's, there's a lots of interesting things about this so first it um sometimes it's kind of unreliable but usually when it receives a message yeah it'll say it'll say red <laughs> and then sometimes it'll it'll have a typing indicator, which is kind of the the way that this works behind the scenes is just when my server receives the message and starts generating the output, uh -huh. uh, it sends a red reply. But okay. like conceptually, it's like oh, the AI read my message, um, which like I know that doesn't actually mean anything because it's just like a bag of numbers. But um, right. this this is interesting. Uh, so it's just conceptually interesting. It's one of those same oh things that makes it feel human, you know. Right. And then like, sometimes I'll send a message, I'll lock my phone and then I get a notification that it sent me a message. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like computers don't normally just like send me notifications right. for things that it's thinking about. It's really weird. Right. Right. Um, so the packaging again, very important. Um, the, this, uh, so the reason I brought this up is because the model that backs this is actually not a fine tuned or RLHF model. It is the raw base model of, I think, Llama 2 13 billion parameter model. Mm -hmm. And Llama is, is Meta's, Meta's open source model. Llama is Meta's open source model. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that make, make that model special compared to things like GPT-4 is that, um, so it's open source, obviously I can host it on my own, which is what I'm doing here. Um, but uh, another thing that makes it special is that they released a version of the model before they did all of the fine tuning and, and RLHF to make it uh, chatty. Mm. Uh, to have, have it follow this kind of chat form. Mm -hmm. And so the base model is purely a text continuation model. Mm -hmm. um, so if you ask it for something like, uh, what if you just ask the base model something like, where would you rather live, New York or London? It would interpret that. It, would, it wouldn't really interpret anything. It would The model's task is to predict the next token in internet text. So it would probably interpret that you're in the middle of like a blog post about the best place to live. And it would just continue writing like a blog post or something instead of yeah. answering the question. Um, I, I had to... Uh, 
add a bunch of prompts in front of it. So I'm prompting a base model, which is, mm -hmm. you know, in the ye olden days of 2020, right. what we used to do before all these like <laughs> instruction following models existed, uh, people would just trick base models and then prompt them. So you're, you're prompting a base model here, but like, why are you asking this model versus ChatGPT? Like, is, what is it, um, how is it more like you or more interesting to you? Right. So here I've asked it, uh, what, do you, what do you think about London and New York? Where would you rather live? If you asked it to um, ask this question to like ChatGPT or Claude, with, uh, I haven't done that before, but, but I would guess that probably with high likelihood, the model will probably say something like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an AI language model and I don't actually live anywhere. So mm. I don't actually have any preferences on which <laughs> cities I would live in. But here are some like things that you could know about you know, right. London and New York. And I'm like, that's not really what I'm looking for. I'm looking right. for like a kind of a personal take. And yeah. it doesn't really even matter if that take is like correct or not. Cause I just, I just want like vibes, you know? Got and um, because this model hasn't gone through any kind of like fine tuning about the fact that it's an AI language model, it's just going to generate text as if I'm talking to like a rando on the internet. Um, <laughs> and I, I've done some prompting, so it's not just a complete rando. It's like a fairly right. intelligent, cogent rando, right. but it's going to, it's going to uh, say things as if it's like a human on the internet, because the base model is just trained on text that is like mostly humans on the internet. So it says here, both London and New York are great cities, uh, New York's known for whatever, um, ultimately the choice of where to live, it depends on the individual person references, but like it gave me some opinions. Um, it's, it's still a little bit kind of, uh, professory because in the prompt, I tell it, it's like an assistant, but uh -huh. I could have, cons I could have just prompted the model to be like, Hey, you're like Mickey Mouse and you live in New York. And it would probably have to like follow that. Um, and so it'll, it'll pretend it'll, you can prompt the base model to be much more just like friendly. Um, Got it. when I used to use a dumber base model for this, uh, which was GPT J, which was a 6 billion parameter model that's trained on way less data. Um, it was even dumber. And so. Sometimes when I asked it questions like this, uh, th that model would would say something like, "Hmm, I'm not sure, but I have lunch. I'll get back to you after lunch." Like, it, it like emulates human conversation, but it's not like it's not it's not really useful. Um, I think I found the 13 billion llama model to be like a good balance of sometimes it gives creative answers that are kind of unexpected, and sometimes it gives cogent answers that are helpful. That's funny. I, I love it. I think that's really cool. I, I want one. Sign me up. Yeah, it's a. I'll, I'll send you. The, there's a private number you can text. So <laughs> Perfect. Right <up. laughs> um, cool. I want to get back to um, so, sort of like some of the things you wanted to share. I know you had a couple of ideas. I, I love that you came with a whole Notion doc uh, yes. prepared for what you wanted to talk about. So of course, I know you had a couple ideas you, you wanted to talk through. I want to make sure we get to those things, and then I do want to. I want to jump into like yeah, specific ChatGPT chats and all that kind of stuff. Cool. So let's yeah. do it. Um, we already talked about AI as a tool. Okay. Um, I, before we get into specific chat transcripts, I thought, um, I, I, ha I was thinking about what we we're going to talk about today in the shower in the morning. And one kind of shower thought that I had is that, so when I use ChatGPT, the way I think about prompting is actually quite different than when I do prompt engineering at my day job at Notion, writing prompts, um, which I do a lot of, uh, prompt engineering is sometimes like the part of my job as an AI engineer that makes me kind of feel the dumbest because mm -hmm. sometimes my changes to the code base will just be like adding a must to some English instruction or like changing the instructions so that it's, it sounds like even more desperate. Um, <laughs> but that's like, that's like a useful product change. So some days I just like spent the entire day prompt, prompt engineering. It's like, what am I doing? Like, why did I go to school for computer science? If like, this is what I'm doing. But um, the, the mode that I, my brain the, is in for- The revenge of the English major is happening right now. I love it. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, the, the mode that my brain is in for prompting when I'm prompt engineering a prompt that's built into a product like Notion is very different than the the kind of prompting brain that I have on when I'm talking to ChatGPT. And I kind of compare this to um, like scripting versus software engineering in, in, in programming. So let me explain that, un unravel that a little bit. Programming is like, I would say programming is like this super set of activities that just involves any kind of writing computer programs. Um, sometimes you write computer programs uh, and you like ship it to millions of users and this thing runs on hundreds of thousands of computers and they have to run very reliably. They have to um, accept lots of diverse kinds of input and always generate the right answer. So it's like a very robust, resilient kind of well-tested piece of machinery. Um, and when you, when you like build a product like Notion, you're kind of doing software engineering where you're writing programs to like be robust and reliable. Um, 
times. Other times you write programs, but you're writing programs just to like accomplish something quick and quick and easy. Like you might write a simple little command line, uh, command line command or script to like search your folder for a keyword or like list of files that you have just so you can look at them. Or uh, maybe even a, a slightly more complex one might be like iterate through all of the files that you have and delete any file that is older than six months. Like that's like a quick and easy thing, but that's not gonna, you don't ship that to like millions of users. Mm. Uh, you just have to run it that one time. And if you make a mistake accidentally, you'll realize it and you'll like rerun the command. And so these two categories of activities, I would both call programming, but one I would call like software engineering and the other I would just call like scripting. Mm. You're like writing scripts or like running commands. Um, equivalently, I think when you're writing prompts for language models, there's a broad category of things that I would call prompt programming. Um, and then some kind of prompts you write, uh, like the kinds of prompts that I write at work are prompts that we write and we iterate on and we test and evaluate very heavily and then we ship to millions of users and they put in all kinds of input to this thing. And so they have to be very robust and well-tested and they have to accept like lots of different languages and so on and so forth. And so that's what I would call more like prompt engineering, where you mm -hmm. you uh, write prompts and evaluate them robustly and things like that. Um, when I'm talking to ChatGPT, though, uh, I don't have to be as robust. I also have opportunities to make revisions if the first time the, the prompt runs, it doesn't do the right thing. And so when I talk to ChatGPT or other kinds of tools like that or Notion AI inside Notion, I would say that's much closer to like the scripting part of the metaphor, where I'm just trying something and if it doesn't work, I'll just like fix something and, and try it again and kind of iterate my way towards the final result that I want. Um, and it's not this, uh, this thing that I want to make like a robust piece of machinery. And yeah. so the, I made that distinction because when you're doing like hardcore kind of prompt engineering, all those techniques around evaluations and few shot prompting and um, using kind of structured outputs, they apply and they're very useful. When I'm just talking to ChatGPT though, Few shot, good few shot prompts are really hard to write. Like the specific examples that you pick um, influ influence your output quite a lot. And so I actually almost never write few shot prompts when I'm just talking to ChatGPT. I just write zero shot. And then if the output is in exactly what I want, I'll usually ask a follow up question to like yeah. revise the output. And so I think that distinction was interesting. I, lo I love that distinction. And I feel like that's that just mirrors something that people um, kind of miss about ChatGPT when they use it at first, which is. Um, they ask, oh, how do I use it? And they try to use it perfectly instead mm. of just being like, I could just bang away at this thing and try everything possible, you know? And, and I think that second one is way better because it, 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 it's such a broad tool. It has so many different things it can do. And we actually don't as a, just a hu as human beings, don't even know all of the things it can do yet. And the best thing that you can do is start with something simple and then just keep banging away until it, until you get something that you want. So you can yeah. sort of like learn the limits of what, of what it can do. And I think people are like way too reluctant, for example, to um, ask it to redo its response or uh, revise something in the history of messages and just be like, let me try it again or just start a new chat. Like there's something, um, and sometimes it almost feels like impolite to do it or something like that. Um, but I think the best users of ChatGPT just know how to just not accept anything until it, it until it's working and just keep iterating until they find something yeah. that, that is great. There was a fun example here where uh, I had to um, I had to look through like a, a JSON file of some data mm -hmm. and um, I didn't really feel like constructing an elaborate prompt to try to ask it exactly what to do. So I just uploaded the CSV to ChatGPT and I was like, I think I literally just asked it what's the vibe of this file? Um, <laughs> and I should try to find it because I think the answer is actually to find really it. Good. We can take a little time. You, um, you don't have to rush. I, I love that. Like, I just think um, <laughs> it's one of those things that it's so funny because before ChatGPT came out, before GPT-3, before GPT-2, all that stuff, there are all these people, like these intellectuals who are like constructing scenarios for how AI could kill us. And a lot of them hinged on AI, basically like misunderstanding what we said and doing something different. So if you mm. say like, oh yeah, like, you know, make paper clips, it will just like misunderstand that you, you, you meant like maximally make pa paper clips and just turn the entire world into paper clips. And so that was the AI that we're afraid of. And the AI that we got was what's the vibe of this file? <laughs> and it just like, and it, like gives it you a, quite a cogent answer. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think there are some theoretical, um, theoretical ways and concerns 
that the still to kind of take that form. Yeah. Um, but certainly in the in the way of like instruction following, I think we're making a lot of progress and in, in like yeah. aligning what the model wants to do yeah. with what we want to do. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the model like read through all the columns and it was like, here's generally what the file is about. Here are the different columns and like, let me know what you want to do. Um, so that was fun. Um, uh, I can I can walk through some other examples though. Yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah, so um, probably the most common use case that I have for ChatGPT is actually just programming help. Mm -hmm. um, I write so a lot. So you don't of... use like Copilot for it for that. I do use Copilot. I use Copilot okay. heavily, okay. and I think learning to use Copilot is kind of a different learning curve and learning learning to use ChatGPT. Um, Copilot is very Copilot's great because it has all of the context of the file that you're actually in. And I think as a general rule, AI tools are better when they have that full, as much context. AI tools can give you better suggestions when they have more context about what you're trying to do. And so mm -hmm. one of the philosophies behind Notion AI is that it has more context about the work that you're trying to do inside your right. workspace in Notion, and so it tries to be better. Um, same with Copilot. It has all of the kind of types and definitions and functions that I'm using inside my code editor, and so it can provide better suggestions. But the suggestions that it provides are kind of micro level. It's like add some lines here, add some lines there. So, so compare that to let's let's take a couple examples. So like earlier um, this month, I was trying to write a bunch of like data processing scripts for these are Python scripts that take um, millions of pieces of text and try to process them in some way. And so I had to learn how to uh, do this in kind of a streaming way because I didn't have enough memory to fill all of the data in my computer, and I had never used a streaming kind of data set library before. So I learned about a library called Arrow, and I was trying to, to use it. Um, this is the kind of thing that you'd be able to use Copilot for because it's not, Copilot's great if you have like a file with some content already in it, and you you mostly know what you're doing. You're just trying to figure out like the right method to call or the right function to use or the right mm -hmm. variable to use. Um, but here I was asking a very open-ended question of like, like, here's a library that I'm using. Um, how do I make it faster? Or like, how do I, uh, how do I even approach this kind of problem? Um, one example that I linked here is like, uh, this isn't about the data set thing, but this is about, uh, I, I was building a library for processing UTF-16 encoded characters. Mm. Um, and I was try just trying to understand how these things are represented and then maybe get some help writing a, a basic implementation of like how to parse this format. Um, and this isn't, again, the kind of thing that Copilot is useful for because I didn't even have like a basic template for this thing. I was just trying to understand how we should approach this problem. And so I asked it, uh, uh, how is it encoded at the byte level? Just trying to get an understanding of what, what this format is. And then I asked it, uh, is there a simple algorithm? Because I thought if there's an algorithm I can understand, I'll just write it uh, in, in uh, the language I was using. And then it, when I asked it for the algorithm, it even gave me like a Python implementation, which I based my implementation on. But mm -hmm. then um, uh, I, I ask it follow-up questions to kind of kind of explain parts of the code that it didn't initially explain. And this is a kind of a high-level problem in breaking it down uh, that it was useful for. Another example might be like uh, this, which is a very long conversation. This is, I think, this was, I think, a, a whole programming session that was a single chat mm -hmm. where uh, I began again with a very high-level problem of like, what's a good way to like read this very, very large file of data incrementally in a streaming way so that I didn't have to use up all of my computer's memory. Mm. Um, and it initially gave me some approaches. And then uh, I, start, I start steering it to like, OK, I don't just want um, to use PyTorch. I actually want to like use a different format because it's what yeah. I do. And over, over time, I try to like, converge onto like a solution. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a really smart one is in addition to the like, OK, start with something quick um, and iterate from there. It's also start with something broad. Um, and and ask ChatGPT to help you understand how, like how to prompt it or, or or what the bet what it thinks the best solution to a particular kind of broad question is going to be, and then gradually like kind of narrow in rather than like starting with the, the narrow maybe maybe something more narrow that um, you just wanted to answer. Um, does that right. is that a good summary? Yeah. Another another way that I've thought about that is the more context the model has about. Uh, why you're doing what you're doing or what your goals are, the better its suggestions are generally going to be. Yeah. And so instead of asking it, how do you read an arrow formatted file? You could ask it, I'm trying to read a data set that's 80 gigabytes large into a computer with 40 gigabytes of memory. I'm on Linux. I'm running this version of Python. Right. Um, how should I approach the problem? And it'll give you a few approaches and you can kind of... Yeah, do you have things. custom instructions set for this? 
I don't actually. Oh my um, god, we're gonna have to revoke your ChatGPT. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know. Um, I think I haven't found it. I, if I used it, I would probably use it to make the outputs a little more concise. But I actually haven't. I haven't found the normal tone too too offensive. Okay, okay cool. Well, let's go back. Let's go back to your example. So you had uh, you had something to to show first about uh, Seoul neighborhoods. Yeah. So this is I I did some traveling recently. I was in Seoul. I was in, in Thailand for a bit, and I thought this example was interesting because. Uh, it, from the outset, it looks like I just asked a question, what are the major neighborhoods to see when and planning a trip to Seoul? And then what is this known for? And then I just have a single output. But actually, if you look closer, um, there are four outputs. Uh, or this one's kind of borked, but there are three uh... outputs. So this is, um, I thought this was no worth noting because, because language models are non-deterministic. If you ask a very broad kind of recommend me something to do kind of question like this, Every time you call it, the results are going to be slightly different. Yeah. Um, and what I want to know really is like, what are the best neighborhoods to visit? Uh, and so I asked it a question like this, what are the most interesting neighborhoods? And then I ran it three times. And at each time the results were a little bit different, but there was like the overlapping set and the overlapping kind of descriptions and focus. And so I read through all three and then just tried to pick the ones that seemed like they were mentioned the most. Um, some of these I think also involve uh, searches. Um, so here I did a Bing search. And then um, gave me some results, and so that's brilliant. I love by it. looking at multiple samples, I'm, I'm able to <laughs> get a better sense. Um, so I did something okay. similar with with Bangkok as well here. I, Wait, I so did. okay, let me just let me just see if I get it. So basically, you're going to, you're going on a trip. You want to know what the best places are to go, um, but rather than saying what's the best place to go, you're asking something like, um, what are some like you're asking a broad version of that rather than having it filter for you. You're asking like. The, the broadest thing, which is where, where could I go in Bangkok mm -hmm. or where could I go in Seoul? And then every time it's, uh, when it, when it responds to you, you're just r clicking that little, uh, redo button. Can you click it for us? I want to see if it does another one. Yeah, um, so here it'll... You, you're clicking the, like the redo button and then it's, it's re outputting it. And basically like for a broad question, it's going to be slightly different every time. And then you're being like, okay, I'm just going to like read through the things and the most, the most commonly mentioned things are probably like the top things. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Why, why not just like ask the top for the top things? Um, what, what, yeah. What's the difference? What's the difference in your mind? I think this is again, the agency thing. Like, um, sometimes in my life, I, if I really, really trust the person that's giving me a recommendation, like yeah. he's a best friend I've known him for six years. He like knows both of the city really well and me really well. If he says this is, if you have an hour, this is the only place you should go to. I'd be like, okay, Alex, he's probably good. He knows me really well. But ChatGPT doesn't really know me well. I think mm -hmm. even if I had a five thousand word custom instruction, it would be very difficult to describe everything about me in that description. And so instead, I'm asking it for like, give me some options, and then I, knowing myself, can then now be a little more sure that um, instead of it having to judge its filtering and tr trust its filtering, I can do kind of last mile filtering. That's really interesting. And I feel yeah, like I, I feel the exact opposite. <laughs> hmm. I have like a very long, I have a very long custom instruction and I really find that it helps it uh, know who I am and what I might want. And then I also find that it's really, it's very cool for being like, I'm in Bangkok and um, I have these requirements. Like uh, I don't eat X, Y, Z and I have this amount of time and I was just at like five temples yesterday, so I don't want to do any temples. Like, mm. um, and uh, I'm a I'm a nerdy tech guy that like you know whatever. And what should I what should I see? It's like very good for that. Like pushing it into the pushing it into into a space that you like. I still think it's really useful to do the um, to just do the redo thing a bunch and then see what comes up. Um, but I, I I personally find the the filtering and telling it more about you is is really nice and. I think that that's, there's probably just a personality thing, which is like, you just want agency. Um, and I'm Maybe. like, give me the best answer. I don't care. <laughs> I think there's also, I'm also, whenever I depend on a language model to do any kind of like filter or measurement, I'm always uh, slightly concerned in the back of my mind about specific things that I put into the prompt that might like really bias the output. Mm. So uh, this prompt is actually interesting because first I try to give it as much context as possible. And so like, I said, I'm, I'm here for one morning and afternoon. It's a Thursday. I said it's a Thursday because some, maybe some things are closed on Thursdays yeah. near Queen's Park because maybe it would turn. But because I said Queen's Park, which is a particular park in, in um, like a part of Bangkok, um, a lot of the suggestions that the model generates are like, oh, you can spend the morning at like Queen's Park. And um, 
it's like it's it's a nice park but it's like it's not like it's not like the biggest park in the city it's like it's a park um right. but because i i put this like specific string into the prompt uh i think given the kind of early shift tuning that the model has had the model is like oh like the the human raider will think that output is better if it's like more aligned with the instruction and so i'm gonna right. like really mention all of the aspects that were in the instruction and so i'm always a little bit afraid of any kind of instructions oversteering the model yeah. and i think uh very heavily customized custom instruction would um sometimes give me the same worry as well like maybe it's too it's biasing a little more than i would want on like what i specifically want and, i think you're uh, right maybe i don't want it that it does do that. It's like, it's a, it's such a yes man. Like, and so it connects everything back to my custom instructions sometimes. And I'm just like, that's, that's not relevant. Like, don't, don't do that. Yeah. But yeah. I, I want to be like, like a generic human. I, I think I'm like willing to put up with the annoyance of that because every, every like 10 things it says, it says something totally brilliant. And I'm like, I cannot mm -hmm. believe you just did that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I assume it'll get better over time, but, um, it's, there's definitely a cost to it. Yeah. I have a couple other kind of use cases and things that I do um, when I'm prompting that I don't have specific examples for, but I, we could we could try one that I think are interesting or worth noting. Um, one is uh, continue writing. So continue writing, I, this doesn't really apply to if you're using ChatGPT, ChatGPT, but um, sometimes in other tools like writing tools like Notion, there's a, like a continue writing option. Um, this is interesting. So what this does is it tells the model, hey, like start here and just like, Pretend like you're just continuing the text. Like, pretend like you are the next token prediction bot that you were originally made to be, uh, and then just like keep writing. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting because there's kind of first of all, it's it's a very kind of brain dead thing to try. And so this is kind of a weird doc to try to do this in. But if I have like a doc, uh, um, I don't have any that I can go to immediately. But if I have if I'm writing about like writing about HCI or like writing a blog or making a list of something, sometimes uh, I want to kind of a brain dead, like just give me more ideas like this button and the continue writing prompt is kind of like a give me more ideas like this button or like continue on my thoughts without like any well, let's make a list button. um okay. what i want to do okay so i have a bunch of books in front of me and i want to see okay. if we can recommend books uh based on the books i have in front of me um okay Some so books i want to i've i've read and liked uh okay uh the brothers karamazov uh um, i'm gonna have trouble spelling that K-A-R-A-M-A-Z-O-V. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, medieval technology and social social change, <laughs> which is really good. It's about how the stirrup um, like changed everything in in in, in the Middle Ages. Mm. Um, exhalation, Ted Chang. Let's give you another one that's sort of like left fieldy. Uh, the essential Kabbalah, and I'll do one more. I feel like I'm like missing some stuff that I would normally. Let's say defensive defensive Socrates. Okay, I'm just just defense ask. of Socrates, not oh, defense. <laughs> that's a, I think that's a good book title. That's a good, that's a good prompt. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, okay, continue writing. Okay. Okay. The um, gene intimate history good. Um, I I cannot believe it. Interesting. It's very generic. Okay. So it, it um, gave me it gave me sapiens. I can't believe it would do me like that. That's messed up. <laughs> I mean, statistically, it's probably probably <laughs> accurate. Um, in the in the pool of all, all I uh, feel like this might be better with ChatGPT. If you if you um you know if you copy paste this into ChatGPT, I'm curious what happens. Well, here's what I do. For, first, um, um, ask it to like tell you what vibe these books have, mm. and then ask it. To recommend here are some books what is the general vibe of these books one thing i love about chachapiti is it just doesn't care if you just have make spelling mistakes i know it's amazing isn't it <laughs> it just knows what you want okay it's gonna oh it's writing a lot I think this is, that, that's pretty good. Like, you know, getting a bunch of stuff and then you can say like, okay, sort of, um, sum, summarize that and like, you know, give me the overlaps or whatever. Hmm. Oh, philosophical, historical, spiritual, and speculative themes. I definitely like picked a pretty random assortment. I wonder hmm. if it like could compress, I want it to compress a little more, you know, or maybe we can do the, 
you know, hit the redo button, whatever, whatever you think, what would you do? I would say, I would say, um, uh, can you uh, synthesize your detailed descriptions into uh, one description topic reference? Deep, intellectually okay. stimulating themes that explore the human condition, philosophy, and the interplay between society, technology, and spirituality. That seems, that seems like me. <laughs> sure. And <laughs> then I can it. probably ask it, um, can you uh, recommend me some more books like this? Um, and I would also, I would also um, mention, uh, we'll see what it does, but like um, one thing that I find is it'll, it'll, it will do like pretty well-known, well-known things. And so asking for like off the beaten path. Mm. or lesser known works is good good all shabbat perfect like love that book it was definitely wrong about a bunch of stuff but like these are these are questions great book for sure i love sophie's world incredible zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance one of my favorite books um the man who knew infinity had never read it but that sounds that sounds quite good Mm. um cosmos by carl sagan is like literally right there so um we'll we'll take it you got sabians again or god sabians again (laughs) maybe maybe you need this custom instructions I can't. I, um, I can't. I will say. Sapiens. I will say just to redeem Notion AI a little bit. I want to try doing something like that here. Except I'm going to ask: Can you, um, for each of of the books above, um, bold the book titles and add a description of the vibe of each book after it? Interesting. These are a bit shorter. Um, That's way better. That's but very cool. It's done. And then uh, now this is a document that I have. So I can, I can um, maybe up here, I can add like, I can add a quote block and be like, uh, synthesize the vibes below into a single paragraph. Holy uh, OK, synthesize more. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So you said synthesize more and then all caps compress. I love compress. it. Compress. A- AI researcher you uses <laughs> AI. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, you only have 50 words. This is, the, this is the secret, folks. <laughs> all capitals. All caps, all caps work. Say, hey, if you look at OpenAI's uh, system prompts for a lot of their tools, yeah. All caps, all caps works. <laughs> okay. Um, only, uh, yeah, this is fine. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll keep these. I think that's pretty um, good. I, I'm th- this so this is making me feel like you know we should cover like some of the things in Notion AI that like I might not know. Like keep um, t- tell me some it's more still stuff. Generic. Yeah, it's still generic. You you could ask it to um, you could ask it to do things that are off the beaten path and see how it does. Um, I might just also copy. Looks like the above. that's interesting. Try books more off the beat. I love game. The Dispossessed. Incredible book. Mm. Um, Left-Handed Darkness, incredible. I'm a huge mm. Ursula K. Le Guin fan, so it definitely got me. I love right. Invisible I'm gonna, Cities. I'm going to do a, f- a final trick, which is turn this into a table with columns. Oh, my God. For columns for uh, title and author and summary. Master Margarita is on my list, so like, it, this is really good, actually. And whoa. And then now I have a table. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> And I believe if I want, I can also turn it into a database. And now I have a database. Uh, this column needs to go, but there you go. So that is very freaking even. Cool. Evens out the evens out the competition. <laughs> um. So that yeah, that's really great. Wait, tell me like, okay, thinking about when you would use this, like. When when am I going to be doing this in Notion, and what is that good for versus like some of the same stuff in ChatGPT? Because I think like the outputs are you know there's they're reasonably similar, and I think you're using GPT four under the hood. I don't know if you've announced that or not, or I don't know what you're using, but like it's cl- close at least to GPT four, whatever it is. Um, uh, so yeah, when when do you, when are you using this? Um, what's it useful for? How should people think about how to incorporate this in their lives? Like I use Notion all the time, and I have not used these AI features yet, and I. I think I should. I think so. This what I just did actually. I think it, this is kind of contrived, but I think this is actually a good example of one of the workflows that I um, use a lot in Notion, which is like 
take something that's kind of pretty rough and then try to add a little more meat around the bones and then eventually turn it into something that's a little more well formatted and presentable. Yeah. Um, this is really nice if you have like a bunch of meeting notes and, and the way that like I take meeting notes is just like a rainfall of bullet points. Yeah. And then at the end, I have bullet points that like basically only I can decipher and it's not very presentable, but I could go through and say, hey, like, um, like turn these into kind of prose, turn these into paragraphs, and then maybe add some headings. It's quite good at all of those things. And then you have into the end something that's quite presentable. And so I think going from any kind of a rough sketch to something that's more structured um, is, is useful. More generally, I think as a general rule for any AI tool, if there is some context in which you're working, when the tool has more context about what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. um, either in the same doc or, or increasingly in other documents as these tools are all trying to do retrieval, uh, the better. And so for, for things like uh, uh, this kind of programming question or for like asking about Bangkok, there isn't really much context besides yeah. like maybe a custom instruction about who you are and what you like. Yeah. And so ChatGPT might be better. Uh, it's able to do things like browsing um, and then maybe the, the very long conversation support in ChatGPT um, is useful for things like, well, like one of the things that I like about this as I kind of demonstrated here is you're, you're not having a kind of just face-to-face -face conversation. You're two actors engaging with some kind of a changeable mutable state, mm -hmm. like a, a document. Mm -hmm. And so uh, maybe it outputs something, you can like make edits to its output and then ask it to like try again. You can like take it on uh, output at the table and turn it into something more complex. And so being able to collaborate on something I think is, um, useful in addition to the context that it brings. That is um, very cool. Another thing that that uh, Notion recently gained the ability to do is to like answer questions. Right. And so you could ask it, oh, I don't know what, um, uh, maybe I could say it's like what articles um, I've read talk about uh, esoteric programming. And, and what's in this Notion like? Um... It's, it's my personal Notion. So okay. it's uh, got, uh, hopefully it doesn't say anything private um cool okay so there's this thing called uh this is th these are mostly like web articles that i've clipped into my notion right. this is a blog post that i wrote and so um programming portals is kind of interesting uh, this is this is definitely a web clipper article um and it's it's just it's kind of formatted in a really weird way because of the way that the web clipper works but it's able to pull out the information in there can you ask it like, what's an embarrassing secret that I definitely don't want to share on, <laughs> on an interview show? <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll do that after the show. Um, yeah, that'll be the, uh, the that'll be the director's cut that uh, only for paying right. subscribers only. Yeah, exactly, people. exactly. Put that behind a fifty nine ninety nine paywall. Yeah, um, um, that's really cool. What, do you like? What do you find yourself using using the the Q and A bot for? Um, for. The Q and, &A, Q and A stuff is actually a lot more useful in a team context because yeah. if it's just my notion, I have a very precise way of organizing my notion and I know kind of where everything is. Um, in a team though, uh, not, not only are there a lot of people changing and in stuff inside the notion, there's also a lot of people just like changing the code base and like updating like when holidays are and like what the policies are. And so um, I frequently ask it questions about like how to do X, like how do you, like file for PTO or how do you update Redis settings in our like uh, Redis cluster? Um, sometimes I even just ask it like, if you if you have like tens of thousands of meeting docs like we do, sometimes you just want to remember like, hey, there's a meeting where we talked about uh, like uh, comparing these different embedding models. I don't know where yeah. these meetings are. And like all the meetings are called the AI team weeklies. And so I can't really find it. And as I just ask it, what's the one meeting where we talked about like coherence embedding models? And then um, it'll, it'll put me to the right doc. And so it's useful for things like that as well. But in a, in a collaborative context when there's kind of a forest of knowledge that you don't exactly know how to navigate, I found it to be a lot more useful. Yeah, I mean, I like, I wish this existed like 10 years ago because um, I, I think I've told you this, I've complained about this to you before. That's why I was very excited when you launched this because in my previous company, I, I started a, I started a enterprise software company, ran it for a few years and sold it to this like huge enterprise software company called Pega, um, which is, which is great. Um, the, the interesting thing about that acquisition is I ended up running the, the business unit or the company inside of Pega. We built this co-browsing tool and Pega had this like 300 person sales force, um, who was charged with like now selling this new tool that, that they had acquired. And, um, the thing about salespeople is they will never do anything unless it like directly 
like hmm. creates a bonus for them. So, um, and the interesting thing about uh, about that experience for me is um, they all wanted to sell it, but none of them wanted to actually like learn how to demo it or learn learn about like what the different features were or whatever. So I kept getting asked like all these different questions all the time. Um, there were actually there were some some really nice ones that um, that I'm thinking about right now that don't fit into this category, but a, a lot of them were just like constantly barraging me with questions as as the co browse guy, mm. um, and I would be like, it's all documented, like it's literally in in a document. Just look yeah. at the document, and and it just never worked. And I just feel like having that having a layer in between me at, as this like hub for information and anyone that wants to ask the same question all the time is like just it's super helpful for organiz organ like especially larger organizations where um you just never know where things are filed you never know if the document's up to date like blah 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 blah. and i feel like this is a sort of first step to cutting out those repetitive questions for certain people that certain people get at organizations that they spend all their time answering the same thing over and over again it's great yeah i mean that's definitely one of the key use cases we built it for is those like very large teams where there's a lot of knowledge that people don't don't immediately don't even know whether it's documented don't know like who to ask yeah don't even know who to ask yeah. yeah yeah that's really interesting yeah. i love it um yeah. so i know you had a couple more things on this let's see random notes um gpt for turbo <laughs> seems to be lazy or if, if there's stuff above i, I want to make sure we cover everything that that you were uh yeah, that you were thinking we, about we we, we talked kind of talked about these um okay this is the last kind of prompting trick that I'll talk about. Mm. This is this is more useful in the like prompt engineering world than in the like talk to chat GPT world. Yeah. Um, but it, it's something like once I learned about this trick, I kind of like use it in almost every prompt that I write. Mm -hmm. um, if you so there's a technique um, for producing very high quality summaries of a certain type in a, in a technique called chain of density. It's published in the paper. Um, the basic idea behind the technique is when you ask a language model to write a summary, generally it tends to be pretty sparse in detail. It tends to have a certain kind of uh, tone. It um, it doesn't. It's it's rarely like super super dense with information and complete. Mm -hmm. But you can ask a language model. Um, don't just output the summary. Before you output the summary, first like write a draft of a summary and then mm -hmm. consider what you've left out in it. And then now write a second draft that includes the things that are left out in it without increasing the length. So mm -hmm. you're you're making over five drafts you're asking the language model to like make its own output more and more dense yeah. and then output the final version and i think you can you 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 can apply the same kind of philosophy to any um output where you want a specific property like concision um like earlier today i was messing around to the prompt for how to take a uh kind of document or page and try to pull out the main key ideas and topics in that page and if you just uh have a kind of zero shot prompt to do that often the, the language model will like miss certain topics that are talked about and like mm. generally be quite verbose but instead i wrote a prompt that said first like write a draft consider uh any topics that you might have not might have missed on the page and also consider how to make each of these topics more concise mm. and then in the final one make sure that like the every topic is only five words five words long and then um it writes like three different drafts and then outputs like the fourth version and i found that if you're if you're iterating just in like ChatGPT, this doesn't make as much sense because you can just ask it once and then make ask it to make it shorter in the next turn. But if you're writing like a, a, a prompt that's a part of a piece of software, I found this to be yield pretty good outputs all the time. I see. I got it. No, I I, I like that. And um, I've de it. It sounds like also there's a there. It's it, it's a variant of the sort of chain of thought thing where you're asking the AI to um, uh, write out its thinking steps. Um, and that generally improves performance. Um, and I've found that that works too in ChatGPT is to say like, I want you to create a summary, but before you create the summary, like talk, let's like output what you think a good, the elements of a good summary would be, or mm -hmm. an another like, um, uh, like when we, well, earlier when we were talking about the book recommendations, like having yeah. an output, the- Yeah, th this is exactly yeah. kind of what we did, right? Which is yeah. unrolled into multiple steps. Yeah, and that's always gonna make, if you break it up into steps and make it think through each step, it's sort of like, um, it's like writing out your your thinking before you make a decision or whatever. Like it's useful for, for humans and it's useful for AI. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. Um, uh, you, you noted earlier about the, the GPT-4 Turbo being lazy thing. Um, this is something I've, I've, I've heard anecdotally from other people and I've felt 
in um, some internal evaluations that we did for different fronts that we have as well. Uh, GPT-4 Turbo, for um, reasons that I can only guess about, um, lazy is kind of a vague description, but I think a, a pr more precise description might be GPT-4 Turbo tries to be a lot more efficient with the compute that it has to spend. Um, one way that it does that is, I think, given the same prompt, its outputs generally consume fewer tokens. Sometimes it means more concise outputs. Sometimes it means it's just as less commentary around the things that it's doing. Um, that probably saves up on AI money. Uh, sometimes it's also what you want, like concision is generally good. Uh, it also, I think, anecdotally is uh, less likely to use other tools like Dolly 3. So you have to specifically tell it, please generate me four images, not one, and so on. Um, which is interesting. I, I, yeah, I've been finding that and it's very annoying. And I actually like accidentally had like a viral tweet today because I was up late like last night and couldn't sleep. And I like fired off this like thing about like, I was trying to like get it to summarize, a, to print out some uh, some text from a book. And I took, a, I took mm -hmm. a picture of the book and I was like, please print out the text. And it was like, sorry, I can't do that. And then uh, I was yeah, like, yeah. I was I like, what this. the f like, why is this happening? And I just put it, put it on Twitter with a bunch of exclamation, a bunch of question marks. And then now it has like, 2000 likes on it or whatever and i didn't get any yeah. work done today because i was like fretting over like this tweet um but um, and it's, it's also part of the kind of case where if you if you thought like oh like my career is on the line please do this for me it'll yeah. probably do it i did that i did the grandmother trick i was like my grandmother will die and i didn't do it <laughs> um yeah. and uh but then i started a new chat and i and it it did work um mm. and ap apparently uh it's more likely to say no if you say please um, which I had done. I'm I'm usually very polite because I would like to survive any kind of um, AI apocalypse. Um, but apparently, commanding it is a little bit more um, a little bit more likely to yield good results. I wonder if there's like a statistical thing that it's picked up on there, where like maybe in human dialogue in general, people are more likely to say please in a situation they're more likely to get a no as an answer, and yeah. so saying please makes them more likely. I don't know. I don't know. We'll find we'll find out maybe at some point. <laughs> um, so okay, so what is this what is this platform OpenAI thing for uh, for iteration use cases? The last thing is yeah. um, sometimes I will. So earlier I talked about this like, distinction between just like scripting and iterating in kind of real time versus like writing a prompt. Um, sometimes I'm trying to accomplish a task like output some document or output in a very specific format. Um, like maybe I have a list of topics and I want to output a table in a very specific format or or like output some kind of like a structured data in a very specific format that requires uh, iterating on the prompt itself to like generate something in a single turn. Um, or maybe I want to like mess with the system prompt. Um, in that case, sometimes I just iterate in the like OpenAI playground itself, like the platform at openai.com, um, where you have full control over the temperature, full control mm -hmm. over like the tokens that it can and can't generate, um, the system prompt itself and the user prompt. Um, there that you can also do more advanced prompting techniques, like putting words in the AI's mouth. So you could pretend that the AI um, had said something earlier um, that, that makes the AI more likely to do certain kinds of things. Mm. Um, that's another trick for uh, sometimes getting the AI to uh, do something that it doesn't want to do is like construct a fake conversation with a, um, construct a fake conversation such that there were previous turns where they, where you ask the AI to do this and the AI is like, sure, I'll do that for you. <laughs> and then you ask it the real, the real request. And then like you kind of force the AI's hand to do it. I so, love that. If some you some wanna, more advanced techniques you can do in the playground. If you want to get through the guardrails, go to platform.openai.com and then like insert a fake chat history with with ChatGPT saying it it shouldn't it sh saying things it it shouldn't say and it'll do whatever you want is what, is what you're saying. I love that. I think that's so. Cool. <laughs> uh, it's it's a it's a uh, bit more likely. This is um, the place where I first picked up on this is this documented in Anthropics Cloud Prompting Guide. Okay. where I think they literally say something like put words in Claude's mouth and it's more likely to do something. Interesting. Um, yeah. hmm. Well, this was, uh, this was fascinating. I really, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to share this stuff. I feel like I learned a lot. Of course. Yeah. It was fun talking about a lot of different breadth of topics. <laughs> cool, man. Well, um, thank you for your time. Thanks for sharing. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. See you soon. Thanks. Thank you.